I just want to uh, uh, thank everybody for, for uh, coming uh, and being here at the Fatima Conference. These are wonderful and educational. Uh, you've, you've heard from the Brain Trust, and now you're going to hear uh, and be stuck with me because I'm just going to go right down. You're up, up high in the elevator with Chris, and now we're going to go all the way down to ground level and see what's going on in the ranks. So the first thing is thanks be to God for the gift of life and for each other who, despite our wickedness and failures, still sends us beauty in a rotten world and rain upon the just and unjust. There's a beautiful picture to remind us there's still beauty in the world. Anyway, I'm Stacy Vogel, an old warrior, and the title of my talk is A Sword in the Heart. Uh, and I do want to thank Chris for his presentation uh, of the scary shifting sands on high. Now to ground level for the view from the ground and what's going on in the hinterlands, because that's basically where I work. I'm probably below a private first class in the, uh, in, in the war uh, for, uh, for God's kingdom. Uh, there's this little boy who runs down the stairs into the kitchen at full speed, full tilt, very upset. And he says, Mother, are we made from dust? And she says, Yes. And he says, Well, uh, don't the priests tell us on Ash Wednesday that that's what we're going back to being when we die? And she says, Yes, dear, that's, that's totally right. And he says, Well, hurry up, go upstairs and look under my bed, because somebody's either coming or going. <laughs> little kid. <laughs> So we were taught by these battalions of wonderful nuns that the church was one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Never changes. I'm old enough to have been there. Go anywhere, the same everywhere, Catholic identity, right? The Catholic identity. We speak the same prayers. We go to the same mass. We believe the same. We learned about the barbarian hordes in our history classes in the Sadlier um, book series. They had Catholic books because they knew the public school books were not, they didn't have anything of God in them. So we got the right books. We learned about the Muslim assaults on Christians. We learned about the heroic Isabella, who you can't even talk about today. Death, judgment, heaven, hell. Nothing left to chance. Something went wrong, though, as we all know. What, what was wrong is right today, and what was right is wrong today. We all know it. We've all experienced it. Divorce was a sin, and now 50% of marriages end in divorce. But men once went to their deaths to defend marriage. In 1597 in St. Augustine, Florida, the Spanish Franciscans who preached the sanctity of marriage to the Indians were brutally murdered on September 15th, a famous important day in the church, the 16th and the 17th in 1597, along the Georgia coast around St. Simon's Island. But they had baptized and catechized and provided sacraments to tens of thousands of natives. They went bravely to their deaths because they knew that he who gives his life for God and for the gospel gains it. But back then, when I was growing up, you got married, you had children, children were a blessing. Move those. So here, here's, here's the innocence and joy of childhood. There were families, mother, father, children, aunts, uncles, cousins, and the culture of the family in every element of life, in every part of life, even in tragedy and suffering and death. Family and church were the culture, the context, and the way life was, but no more. Once we got lured into the TV culture, which started real sweet, that's the way it works, and family-based. Now the main television for the, just the general channels, if you, if, you know, if you ever flip through them, and you, you know that in plain sight, it's murder and mayhem. That's all you see, murder, shoot. And then they say they encourage these kids in the ghetto with no morals, no right, no wrong. They, they watch this garbage, and, and they kill each other. And then, of course, you know, we got liberal, the liberal brigades coming in, take the guns away, take the guns away. No, bring God back is, is, is what they need, but they don't want to give it to them. Even cartoons and things are awful. I, I've been saving this to bring to talk a long time ago. This is how they characterize children as ugly, grotesque, terrible-looking children. Uh, I had this thing, too, and I worked with a, 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 actually a Protestant minister who really does the kind of work Catholics used to be uh, doing with kids with drugs and everything else. Garbage pale kids. I got a whole deck of them that are the ugliest pictures. This kid has got his eyes popping out and a skeleton and his tongue hanging out. It's the most grotesque 
And this is what kids look at today. It's not little Mickey Mouse and these sweet little things. It's the ugliest distortions. Even on the plane coming down here, there was somebody left a cartoon on the screen at the JetBlue, and I was you couldn't. I didn't know how to turn it off. I didn't realize there were controls on on the the seat uh, the seat rest. I should have, but I didn't. But even a, a long time ago, busy you know little blocks you buy for your children to put together blocks. I found this and I kept it because it was so weird. This is a one of these blocks, lock blocks or big blocks. And look what it has on it. I don't know if, can you see that? That's the Muslim symbol. It's the, it's, it's the moon with the dot in it. They're putting in kids' blocks. Who knows why, but there's always a reason. At any rate, there was a sin crying out to heaven for vengeance. We all know what it is. And now it's glorified. And the day does not go by that it isn't rubbed in our faces, the nightly news, the newspapers, the television. There's a lady who was appointed the head of the, uh, the law school in Albany. It was, it, law school in Albany was a very a good, solid law school. Uh, and she was appointed, and, and her big claim to fame is she fought for same-sex marriage. She saw every, every liberal cause, and that's why these people get these positions, and they're making other lawyers, so you can just imagine. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible thing and a terrible, terrible time we're living in. And, and then we see things in the paper such as this, and I was going to scan it, but I didn't. Uh, here we have uh, the supporters of same-sex marriage, Pooja Mandagiri, and Natalie Thompson kiss outside the U.S. Supreme Court following the historic ruling exchange. And, and, but then on the same page, they had a small picture of Francis arriving at the Queen of the Angels School in East Harlem. Happier than anything, but I don't see him condemning this type of thing. So it's a really awful, terrible time. Well, back in school, the nuns told us only pagans, only pagans burn the bodies of their dead. I remember those lessons. I can see that classroom, those nuns saying, pagans burn the bodies of their dead people, being horrified. And Catholics never did that. Catholics never did that. The body they taught us was the temple of the Holy Spirit. And now probably more, I'm guessing, but I think it's pretty good from what I see on the lay of the land back home. 60% of Catholic funerals are cremations. There's a small box, not a coffin. And you know they're all in heaven now, so you can pray to them. You get told at these funerals. People buy houses and find these boxes in some web-covered corner. And I just show you this, and you know, just you know, a few little odds and ends I'm going to put up for you here. Basically, here's some some lady crying because she found the box with her uh, her brother's remains, and it says, "Apparent remains of Benny Goodman, a Buffalo handyman who died in July of 2010, were found Saturday morning in the charred rubble of the former United, uh, uh, it looks like Memorial and Moss funeral home." Goodman's cremains were found in a box in the storage room, along with other 30 other boxes labeled with people's names and dates of death. And we are, the remains of human beings are treated like so much trash. As you well know, I'm sure you've seen it. Now, Catholic cemeteries in Buffalo are running ads in the history journals of all places using the ancestry craze of why you need a grave and, and to, you know, basically for them to sell plots. Why? because people aren't doing it anymore. And they're saying, well, if you, look, if you want to find your ancestors, you go to the cemetery. Well, of course, if you got some box in some, some basement somewhere, you know, toodaloo, and you're never going to see who was who or what was what if you're interested in that. So basically, uh, we also have um, a time where, if, we're, if we want to move to six over there, we showed respect for the dead with monuments. I don't know if you can move the next picture. That's how people, that's St. Stanislaus Cemetery, and, and people say, well, I spend money on a gravestone. But you know what? It's, it's an act of faith. It shows the faith. You walk through that cemetery. There's the Blessed Virgin, St. Michael the Archangel. Every one of those tombstones is a lesson to us. It teaches the faith. So I don't know that it's a waste of money because the way things are going now, you can't even... I have somebody that works also in a nursery school in my office, and they cannot mention Christmas. They cannot mention Easter. They can't... And they have these kids from infancy... In, in infancy, they're the ones that teach them their first word. They're the ones who teach them to walk. It's, it's appalling. But in the 50s, many married straight out of high school and lived in small houses, and there were children. And now, even what's left of the Catholic schools, if you can find them, preach career and success, because it's all about being successful and making money and having a big house and, and, and nobody in it. And marriage, living in sin, well, what's sin? At the re-education programs they ran for parents at my children's grade schools, we were ordered not to teach sin, mortal and venial. And this is, I mean, it's going back a long way now. My daughter, my, one of my daughters in her 40s, and never talk about hell or purgatory. Well, a few of us didn't drink the Kool-Aid, but many did. So poor neglected two-plus generations of young people. 
They have no hope. They have no hope. They know the shadow church is without substance. And I work with a lot of kids. They get involved in traffic stuff. And I, you know, I used to be a prosecutor. Now I do criminal defense. I help a lot of young people. And you get to relate to them. But basically, you know, you try to, you know, you can really have an opportunity to, to teach them, get their attention, work with them at a time when they're very worried about things. I did it as a prosecutor. I'm doing it now with these young people. But they know the shadow church is without substance. They've been to these things. They, it's, it's empty. It's, it's flimsy. There's nothing there. And they're not fools. And that's why people like people like Donald Trump. He's not some wuss toe dancing on the dance floor while young people are without hope dying of heroin overdoses. I have somebody who works in my office. Five kids from a class she went to the local high school in, it was a public high school, in one week before Easter, died of heroin overdoses. It's prevalent. You look at the death notices, you see beautiful young people, sudden death. Well, you can connect the dots. A lot of heroin deaths. And then we have also the death rates. While it's interesting because the newspapers even are reporting, overdoses spike white mortality. They're saying that basically the drug overdose numbers were stark in 2014. The overdose death rate for whites aged 25 to 34 was five times the level of 1999. And it goes up. It just goes on and on and on. So there's a big drug traffic, but nobody seems to want to do anything about that. And if you look in the background of the politicians with their $7 million, $8 million, $10 million uh, campaign funds, I won't mention any women who think they're running for president or actually the press wants them elected, but you look at their money and where it comes from, very interesting to find the sources of their money. At any rate... Narcan doesn't work all the time, and the priest from South America that I know said there were thousands coming in from China and Japan and worked their way up the U.S. And, and are drug traffickers, tons of it. So does this sound like our culture is crashing? But the .gov, you know, our pal, the Nixon regime, set up titles 18, 19, and 20, and that was in the, what, in the 18, in 1970s, and put billions into anti-Planned Parenthood youth corruptors, which dealt, deal in human pesticides, and now baby dispatching the octopus, which strangles families, sells baby parts, and has corrupted youth, promoting no children, promiscuous conduct. And believe me, we had the Catholic parochial school mothers who used to go to battle. We'd go to battle a school board meeting back when, when we had kids. And we had well-funded opponents who called us every name in the book, and I mean every name in the book. But we fought the battle against destroying the family with pills and devices. Who were the warriors? Lay people. Lay people. We could get round up a bunch of us ladies, throw our coats on, go to those meetings and fight. Go to the meetings and fight in a Catholic school. It was the lay people. If you haven't read the McHugh Chronicles by Randy Engel, I suggest you read it because, honestly, uh, as a young lawyer, uh, you, you would not believe the smut that parents would bring in from their curriculums in Catholic schools that... 30 years ago that was being peddled to these kids. So it was expected by the Catholics in the rank that back then we just we were just waiting for the priests, waiting for the bishops, waiting for the cardinals, waiting for the pope to come out and slam this horrible stuff, these assaults on morality. We, were, we, we just figured, you know, they're supposed to know right from wrong, black from white, and lead the charge uh, for this assault on God's laws. And we were just waiting for them to call out the troops, but they never did. I was one of the troops, and we did it ourselves, but we didn't have the power of the cloth to back us up. And we were, believe me, we were slandered, libeled, called things you never hear in the Bible as the song goes, but it's wrong. So the little boy in my lesson speaks many lessons, because there was a time not long ago, 60 plus years ago, when Catholics, our Catholic youth was, were raised as Catholics. They were taught how to be Catholic. And there was a time, that even when I grew up in, when there was no question about what being a Catholic was and meant and how we were supposed to live. When I grew up, there were seven or eight parochial schools and about 15 Catholic churches within a mile radius. Okay, so picture seven, eight, nine. That, look at this. This is beautiful St. Casimir's Church. That's the beauty of a church and it, within a mile radius, all those churches. All, all we're having, three masses daily. I'm not talking sun. Every day there were masses and sometimes more on Sunday. They almost all of them had thriving grade schools, and there were four excellent Catholic high schools in that circle. Excellent, a mile radius. Four high schools, and they were full. 
Catholic school students knew by their, they were known by their behavior, their study habits, and what they and we all knew was right from wrong, thanks to our parishes and those beloved blessed nuns who taught us every day, God bless and reward them. Nothing like the church countless generations knew, cross and now is the way it is now, who crossed the globe, penetrated jungles and uncharted territories to do as Christ ordered, go forth and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And they did. Men and women championed the cause of Christ. Why? To save souls. To save souls. There is right. There is wrong. There is sin. There is death. There is judgment. There is hell. They went there to save souls. But can you name even one of our hierarchy now or even when this horror, these horrors started before Roe versus Wade because we had liberal abortion in New York before Roe versus Wade? Name me one of our hierarchy going to their death to fight abortion. Name me one. You can't. Government-funded human pesticides doled out with our tax money. Who fought it? Nobody. And, and this is a little sub-note now. I'll be real brief about it. I was uh, working, uh, you know, and going to Washington, working with, we worked with Jack Kemp, we worked with the Reagan administration, and we got things like Judge Scalia uh, on the Supreme Court. Uh, we got Clarence Thomas, and believe me, they were blood bats to get him there. But we were down, and we had dinner at Ann O'Reilly's house. She was the the, uh, the wife of uh, Sean O'Reilly, who was one of the founders of Christendom College. And this young priest came in, and he said he was the bag man for one of the bishops that met with the Reagan administration when Reagan, or not Reagan, but Nixon, who called him in and said, we're going we're gonna to have Title 18, 19, and 20 start funding contraception. And they said, well, we don't want you to do that. Well, if you don't, we're going to liberalize the abortion laws. Oh, well, you don't say anything. Let these titles go through. They didn't say anything. They took their 30 pieces of silver. So by the time the abortion ruling came in, which is a fix way before even was in the courts, there was nothing to do, and they didn't do anything. All right? The once Our once great country was used to christen its ships. You know, we used to, nobody's going to believe this, but we used to christen our ships. I don't know if I can find this thing over here, if I do. But there's this beautiful christening uh, that, that was done. Here it is, from a book called One Nation Under God. And I know everybody's got their, you know, things about the Masonic U.S. But this is how our ships in the Navy were and still are, to my knowledge, christened. Here's the prayer they say when they christen a naval ship. O eternal God. May the vessels of our Navy be guarded by thy gracious providence and care. May they not bear the sword in vain, but as the minister of God be a terror to those who do evil and as a defense to those who do well. Graciously bless the, the officers and men of our Navy. May love of country be engraven in their hearts and may their adventurous spirits and severe toils be duly appreciated by a grateful nation. May their lives be precious in thy sight, and if ever our ships of war be engaged in battle, grant that their struggles may be only an enforced necessity by the defense of what is right. Bless all nations and kindreds on the face of the earth, and hasten the time when the principle of holy religion shall so prevail that none shall wage war any more for the purpose of aggression and none shall need it as a means of defense. All of which blessings we ask through the merits of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. That's the ship christening of the United States Navy. Now you can just see if Obama found this out, what would happen, right? Say no more. <clears throat> All right, the, but anyway, as, as you know, the family, of course, is the basic unit of society, and when it fell apart and Rome, Rome fell apart, but it, the, it was the target of the enemy. Why is the, why is the family so important? Because it replicates the hierarchy of God. The forces of darkness has re, have relentlessly stormed the walls of this fortress, invaded and tainted and poisoned even the very bridal chamber by stealing millions of lives God wanted on this earth. Remember the creed? I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord, the giver of life. Is this the unforgivable sin, rejecting life? You know this all to some degree, more or less. But there were straight assaults, straight out assaults on our faith, our families, and our nation, like huge waves continually pounding the, the shoreline. But where were the shepherds? Who rang the church bell? Who was a Paul Revere for the church saying, bring out the troops, fight these things, put them down? Stand up and scream, holler, make them stop. 
Even in the public schools, they took the Ten Commandments out. Nobody was there to fight, just a few, and few Baptists were there. So who was pounding the pulpit to beat the war drum when abortion became the law of the land? And there were then enough Catholics who could have been ordered not to pay taxes by the bishops. They couldn't have put us all in jail. Murder of innocent lives and no call to war? No call to war. They talked about, well, we can't do this because tax-exempt status, so I guess that's your God, your money's your God. But they could, they, uh, basically, there was nary a whimper calling us to battle. Ironically, there was a call to battle, but it was from the lay Catholics who were taught by those holy nuns and who knew in our, we knew in our guts that you don't stand silent while evil, especially such evil murder of innocent babies in the womb is declared legal. So we lay people have to call them out and the silence is deafening. You see that particular picture. That was at the March for Life. We had to have a banner. Buffalo and New York churches, do your duty. Admonish the sinner. You don't hail the sinner. You admonish the sinner. Now, that venerable institution, the parochial school, we remember the parochial school, is being killed off, at least in my hometown, with military precision and no recourse. Thus, however flimsy these schools are, and they're flimsy, at least they have the title Catholic school, they are a Catholic identity and a home base for our poor, neglected youth, and they are neglected. And the churches, the churches, trashed, plundered, and demolished, worse than the barbarian hordes and the communist flunkies did. It's not just selling off buildings, which is what they say. Oh, it's a building. It's not the faith. They're selling them off for pennies on the dollar. It's also removing the blessed sacrament from neighborhoods. The blessed sacrament is Christ's presence, and it's in churches. And if you take the church away, there's not even the presence of God in those neighborhoods. It's removing the tall spire that reaches to heaven. It's taking away the anchor of hope that Catholic churches have always represented, even when shadows of their former selves. So we now should have some pictures here. This is <clears throat> Sacred Heart Church abandoned back when I was actually when I was in high school and it's a it's a it's a demolished shipwreck. It's just a it's a wreck and you can go see it it's standing there if they say it's in use. This is and Father Gagnon who's in the office will recognize Francis de Sales Church. It's a glorious church. It's been it's been stripped. It's been demolished, and it, it was sold by Bishop Head for one Baptist. They couldn't handle it another one, and it's been looted. Everything's been scraped off. And when we crawled up in this church, we went there because we had to see it because it was for sale. And we looked at it. I climbed up a ladder. I don't know if Father came with me, but we went up to the choir loft, and they left the organ in place. It was rotted, and there were pigeons flying in the church. That's what we get in the city of Buffalo. This is, uh, I don't know which, uh, oh, that's, I think that's St. Mary of Sorrows Church, which is now the Martin Luther King Center. It's a school, okay? Had to do it at gunpoint in the Soviet regimes. Let's see what's next. Okay, this is, I believe, uh, this is, um, I'm not sure, this, this might be Queen of Peace Church. I, I, I don't think it is, it's another church, but anyway, next, the next one after that. We've got some beautiful churches. And this is yet another glorious church in Buffalo. This is what we have, but they're closing them up in, you know, one after another, especially the most beautiful ones. Next, please. And this is uh, Queen, is that, no, that's not, that is St. Joseph's University Church. Now, I ask, call your attention to it, because you can look in the sanctuary. You see some of, it, you know, what church used to be, the altar, you know, facing God, facing the tabernacle. You don't even have, a, there's no tabernacle in there, none. That's, that's, that's what they did to that beautiful church. You won't find a tabernacle in there. So uh, next picture. My mother always said, first they'll take out the, move it to the side, then out the door, and you'll never see it. Now this is the Queen of Peace Church. Beautiful Queen of Peace Church. Uh, glorious church. Next one. I think there should be another one. Another one, yep. Queen of Peace Church on Genesee Street in Buffalo. Wait to hear what happened to that one. Next one, please. All right, that's Queen of Peace Church also. You have an idea of the, the beauty of it. If you put this whole complex of Queen of Peace Church on Genesee Street in Buffalo down in Washington, D.C., hands down, because I do a lot of real estate, 75 million bucks. They, they, that, that's how much was in the church, the school, the rectory, the convent. Next, please. And this was an artist's rendering of when they were building Queen of Peace Church, and the, the, the pastor who was the, um, I guess, pastor at the time they built it, and they stationed a bishop there because it was that glorious in Buffalo. Next one, please. Okay, so there's the story. 
Queen of Peace Church, this beautiful church that you just looked at, was sold to the Muslims for three hundred thousand dollars. Three hundred. That's, that's a copy of the newspaper article, Buffalo News, and they were rejoicing. It's going to be used for something. So, so um, three hundred thousand dollars for the. It's now a mosque. And I know from a friend of mine, there was something up in the choir loft. Now, I'm not, you know, musical very much. I, you know, I'm not really that, you know, knowledgeable. But I knew there was something called a Kilgan organ up in the choir loft, which is apparently a very valuable organ. So much so that people in the, you know, the church music and the music industry contacted the diocese, the Muslims, and said, we will buy it. They were offering, like, it's six figures, lots of six figures, and they were turned down, and subsequently a friend of mine who comes to the March for Life with us went and took pictures, and they were printed in the Polish-American newspaper back home. They took the axe to the organ, axed it, and had a huge dumpster. Every piece of it went out. They threw it out. I also know from another church in the area, which I think there's a, a, there'll be another picture as we move through here, uh, basically, they went and there were some of these statues and stations in the wall, and they took their hatchets and axed off the heads. Uh, and that's what they do, and that's something to come. That's the side of Queen of Peace Church. That church connects to that school. Look at it, it's a three story school. That's part of the 300,000 to the Muslims. Big campus, lots of lands. Uh, next, please. And that is another view of Queen of Peace Church from the outside. Pretty, huh? Now, a mosque. This is the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the tabernacle that was at Queen of Peace Church. I don't know where it is now, but I'm sure it's not there. In, in whoever got it. Next one, please. And then there's a story about Blessed Mother's House. This, you can't see that well, but that was a stained glass window featuring Mary Magdalene in a side niche. There were about probably 25, maybe 30 stained glass glorious windows in that church that I wanted to show, but I'm such a klutz with, uh, you know, with technology and, and things like this. I, I couldn't do them all, but you look at the bottom and there's the names of people who donated money to sacrifice and pay to put those windows in the church. And if you, with these types of assets, if you were in white collar business in the United States and you disperse assets for pennies on the dollar, you know who you'd be talking to even in the secular society. Next, please. There it is. See the nice little mosque? All right. There's a picture up at the top on the inside of it. Everything's all stripped out. And there's, a, then, yeah, the next one is fine. That's their school, okay? Universal school and Jami Mashid. Uh, so you can go there. And if you go to their website, they have been taking over and colonizing in Buffalo. All kinds of churches, all kinds of buildings, they are colonizing. There's one not far from the Blessed Mother's House. Very suspicious place. We tried to get the FBI interested. They could have cared less. Next, please. Okay, and this is Holy Mother of the Rosary, Polish National Cathedral Church. It was sold quite well before Queen of Peace Church was sold to the Muslims, and it is a mosque. And it's a huge complex. It's a walled complex, and it's got a convent, a church, a rectory, the whole business. They're right there on our doorstep. And they're not here for, uh, for being good friends and neighbors, I would anticipate. Next one, please. Okay, you can get uh, Al Huda School. They advertise in Buffalo. You can get all kinds of work to be a teacher at the uh, the Muslim schools, and our schools are closing. Next one, please. Okay, this we went to a a, a party for a, my nephew's uh, ch one of his children's baptisms. It was Susan's Banquet Center. It's a lovely place. Now it's the Islamic Cultural Center. That's up Niagara Falls way. Next, please. <clears throat> okay, here's something of interest. Back in 18, uh, or 1565, there's a memorial to Father Lopez for saying the first mass in the new colony at St. Augustine, September 8, 1565. And you know, at the beginning of my presentation, another 30 years later, they killed all those, uh, all those, uh, uh, Franciscan ministers except one and brutally, brutally killed them because the Indians were into, uh, well, multiple marriages and everything, and they didn't like the one man, one woman thing. You can marry as much as you want. So that just got them hot. They got crazy, and they, they murdered these fine Franciscans who knew we are to convert people and not tell them, shake hands, you're having a good time. I'll go up to the Lutheran thing and, and join in with the, uh, and put the, the, put a Buddha on the tabernacle in Rome, which we've all seen, which is heartbreaking. Next, please. Okay, this is, I'll tell you a little story. This is the back of the school I went to, grade school with Holy Apostles Peter and Paul. 
Uh, it was it was a lovely place to go, but the diocese left it abandoned. And then one of the friends who works with me at this Blessed Mother's house, you'll see some slides, I think, uh, you know, was going around saying, Stacy's going to open another school. She's going to open another school. That was the death knell. Edward Kimmick, then Bishop of Buffalo, who a friend of mine in a traditional church had, a friend of hers saw him wearing the Masonic ring. And uh, she, and I, we all said, how do you know the Masonic ring? And the lady who saw it, who was at a confirmation, said, my father was a Mason, my mother was a Catholic. I saw that ring on the hand of my father every day of my life. So th this was marked, at when we were next door to it. If it was Bishop Mansell, we would have had a school or we would have had loft apartments for mothers to rent and stay there with their families. And they were going to get rid of it because this lady is too Catholic for them. Next one, please. This is the inside of the church at the same site. Now we wanted to have the church. We thought of you know whatever we you know we had we had our eyes on it, but at that point Kimmick was bishop of Buffalo and Dad Stacy couldn't have it, so they sold it. Peace Prince Ministry. It was just a wooden church. The school was like a fortress, best church on the east side or best school on the east side. But that was the church, and here it is taking everything down, and that was going to the dumpster. Now. When that school was being demolished, we found out. I, I said, we have some pews. Can we have the pew fronts? And I asked the demolition guy. And he said, well, Stacy, I have to ask the diocese. So ask the diocese because we had some, some of the pews that were in the church. And he said, he came back to me. He says, you cannot have, the bishop said, you cannot have any church artifacts. Now, I call your attention. Everything inside that church, including the high altars, the side altars, the tabernacle, Christ in the tomb, the, the crucifix you see there was part of the deal to Peace Prince Ministry, a prison ministry for $10,000 lock, stock, and barrel, and we paid five times that to get the convent. Next, please. Okay, this is what they did to the school. It, was, it didn't have to be demolished, and the demolition guy from a fa very important demolition co uh, company, we, walked, we went there to work one day, and our, our, our windows were boarded up, and I, we had to call the police and say, who are you to board our windows? Eventually, I got to know the demolition guy, and he said, Stace, it took him like five or six weeks to demolish it. it. was so solid. He said it didn't have to be demolished. It was a wonderful building, but it was going to go because they're taking down all the, the, all the little veins and arteries that lead kids to the Catholic faith in Catholic school. Next, please. Here's another one. Isn't that nice? And you can see our boarded up windows, they had no authority to do that, but they did it. And by the time I got done with the construction company, they ended up making a nice donation to Blessed Mother's House. We couldn't stop them, but that's what they did. That beautiful school, pile of rubble, carted away, nothing left. Next, please. <clears throat> and this is it from a distance. You can't see it too good. You see bless that, that building in the middle, that's Blessed Mother's House, the old convent of my youth that we, when Bishop Mansell was there, we, uh, I, was, I was driving by going to court one day and I saw this, Jesus ministry in there. And so I, I, I said, I got to go see who's in the convent. So I rang the doorbell. Lady comes out. I Actually, she was a client that I'd done an adoption for. I said, hey, you're in here. Well, what are you? Well, just, you know, Jesus saves or something. I said, can I see, can I see the inside of it? Oh, yeah, you can. she showed me the kitchen and the refectory. I said, I want to see the chapel. Oh, no, you can't go up there. Can't go up there. Eventually, when, we, when they couldn't afford it and moved out and we went up there, we found out that like the, 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 the Protestant the crucifixes in that chapel and around, they tear the corpuses off because they only believe in a cross. You know, once in, that's their theology. So uh, anyway, so we found out about it, put in a bid, lease to buy, and by the grace of God, and people, small donations, we, we got small donations, and we bought the building. We own it. Next, please. All right, that's the church, and there's part of the school that was, it was a glorious complex, basic wood church, but that church is, was sold to Peace Prince Ministry, 10 grand diocese of Buffalo. Next, please. That's the inside of the church, which is now a warehouse. Isn't that nice? Beautiful white pine pews, piled up junk, you name it, and they use it as a warehouse. Next, please. Okay, and that is, uh, that is the, um, I guess, a site that's online uh, about the demolition of Peter and Paul. There's, there's four of these shots in a row. You can just go through them real fast. Oh, that's the chapel at Blessed Mother's House. Now, we have... I'm not saying we, we have altars, we have uh, everything to put in uh, there to have mass. We haven't been able to do it yet because we don't have priests. Uh, we would like 24 hour, hour adoration, but it's a real nice chapel and we fixed it up. It's got some problems where they did some damage. You can see the stations in the hall and everything, but uh, that's it. And we've, we have saved things from the dumpster. I say no more. Uh, next, please. And this is, you can't see it here, but I was going through uh, slides that we had taken of the Blessed Mother's House because it's a U-shaped building. And, and in that doorway, when you look at the smaller version, 
Mike and I were there to take pictures for a Christmas card for the Blessed Mother's House. The door was open, but there were nobody on the premises but you and I. But when you look at the small slide, there is a, there is a shadowy figure with the door open. And I, I don't see these. I hate people who say, oh, my rosary turned to gold. I mean, I'm sure it, sure it did. Uh, but but anyway, honest to goodness, I was getting ready for this presentation. And there's a shadow of a veiled woman holding a child that's reaching like this. When you, It really, it really made me... Stop and think, because I know I was there when Mike took the pictures. My husband used a good camera. You can't see it because it's, you know, it's projected so far, but interesting. Next. And the, you'd never guess what this is. This is the uh, Oakland Place residence of the Bishop of Buffalo. It's a nice place in the ritziest section of town. Next, please. And that is Peter and Paul again. Now Peace Prince Ministry. Next. And this is, oh, this is, this is a very bad picture, but I was at a funeral for a, a, a judge that was a very good pro-life defender. He was a really good man, good, good Catholic from those Catholic grade schools. And you see that little light? That used to be the front entrance of St. Martin's Church uh, on South Park Avenue in Buffalo. So what they did was they, uh, they turned the, here's the back of the church. So, you know, the bride and groom come out and everybody throw rice in them, that kind of, you know, exit the cruciform church. So now they, they closed in the back of the church and the side of the church where, where there were stations is where a, this little table type altar, what they call it, is there. And there's no altar in the front. But that's where the tabernacle is, by the back door. Yep, that's the way it is. Next, please. <clears throat> okay, and this is people still get married. That's uh, my godson's wedding. I was looking for, for a handy picture. It popped up. So, so people still getting married. But you know what they say in those days? Uh, people will marry, uh, be married and, and getting married. And that's... That's basically, uh, that's just a little wedding. Next, please. <clears throat> now, this is to tell you how warped our culture. I started to say this is about a sword and a heart. I'll get to that. But our culture is so shot that I'm in the dog store. I, 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 I bought a miniature dash hound again. I'm I, I, I obviously suffering from some, some insanity. But I had to go there to get some supplies. And on the rack, this is what, this is a dog, a dog jacket. It's how people are crazy. It's mommy's little man. These people are out of their minds. They worship their animals. Next, please. Okay, and this is, now this is a time, and I'll tell you how uh, basically <clears throat> we look at this. And so we saw people married and getting married. And then you look at the pain and suffering of the old days and, and the kind of agony that people went through, normal life, but there was the church for them. That's a little girl's tomb. She's, what, like four years old? Four, a little four-year-old. Next, please. Cemeteries teach you a lot. Next one. Okay, this is a young, uh, young 15 year old boy died, you know, it, it's, um, it says beloved son. Next one, please. Okay, and this is, this is signal to why we're here today. This is in the Our Lady of Victory Basilica, the station where Christ meets his afflicted mother. It's beautiful. It is the most beautiful. These stations are like this tall from, from, from me, you know, from my feet up. They're just awesome. And that's, that's uh, Christ meeting his afflicted mother. And you can just imagine the swords in her heart uh, at that time. And I do want to say that's a beautiful basilica. I don't know if anyone has visited. It's glorious. Father Baker, who rescued all these kids, mothers who were throwing their babies in the canal. He opened a place to, that they could just leave them there. Uh, and, and he, he, he basically had this huge thing. He was a Protestant convert. This guy was a miracle worker. He's gonna, he'd be a saint if we had the money, you know, but he's, I guess you gotta pay for some of that stuff. But he's, he's a wonderful guy, beautiful place. And as Chris was talking, the rules up high in, he's up here with all the intellectual stuff, and I'm so glad to listen to him because I, you know, I don't, I, just being exposed to that and all what they're changing the rules and everything. But in that beautiful basilica where my daughter got married at the first traditional, traditional Tridentine Mass wedding ceremony held there since they started the new Mass. She had a, the whole thing. It was beautiful, beautiful. And we had a glorious wedding there. But in respect to what they're doing now, we know of a family. The, 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 um, the, there was a young man. He was married. He was divorced. He was married in that church in the Basilica. Then he divorced and was remarried. And his second wedding was in the Basilica. So I don't know what they're saying up high, but in practice, things are pretty bad. And we've been to funerals. We're divorced, remarried a couple of times, living in sin, you name it. Walk right up to the communion rail uh, as they have the funeral ceremony. And there's the little box of a uh, mom over there sitting there because, you know, funerals are too expensive. You don't want to put them in the ground because we can just burn them up and, you know, take the proceeds. Next, please. <clears throat> okay, this is another one. This is, I, this is pointed. It's not far from my parents' grave. This, this lady, as you can see, was... 
was she like 31 years old or something? She's in her little pictures in her bride dress. I'm going to say she probably died in childbirth. Um, and, but but people respected and honored the dead. And there's you know you walk through these cemeteries that dead were honored. You know honored. It was holy. And when you went to funerals, people cried. There was there was poignancy. When you went to a wedding, it was like you know you were walking into something from another world because every that girl was walking down that aisle and they were going to get married and that was it. And you felt it. You felt it. Not anymore. It's all, you know, sing songs and hip hop and God knows whatever else they want to put in there. Next, please. <clears throat> okay. And this is uh, this is the DS Ray. You know that uh, when with universal dread, the book of consciences shall be read to the judge to judge the lives of all the dead. For now, before the judge severe, all hidden things must plain appear. No crime can pass unpunished here. When even saint, saints shall comfort need. And think about that. That's for us, and that's also for the hierarchy. So they're in deep trouble. Deep trouble. Next, please. If there's any more. There might not be any more. Okay, next one, if you have one. Okay. <clears throat> and basically, that's part of the DS area. I just thought I'd remind. I like to look at that every now and then, because you need, you need a dose of cold water to remind ourselves what it's about. Next, please. Okay, this is a lovely prayer for children. Um, every now and then, I, you know, my mother was really, she was she was really something, and she she left me a lot of things. And, and every now and then something will show up, and I don't know how it got there. This sh shows up on the side of my bookshelf in my office. And I'll read you the children. Prayer for children, because my heart bleeds for these young people. There's no place for them to go. They're lonely. They're messed up. They're in trouble. But here's a prayer for children. Uh, it's very, the, the actual prayer card is very pretty. It's very old, but... Heavenly Father, I commend my children unto thee. Be thou their God and Father, and mercifully supply whatever is wanting in me through frailty or negligence. Strengthen them to overcome the corruptions of the world, to resist all solicitations to evil, whether from within or without, and deliver them from the secret snares of the enemy. Pour thy grace into their hearts, and confirm and multiply them in gifts of thy Holy Spirit, that they may daily grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, and so faithfully serving they, serving thee here, they may come to rejoice in thy presence thereafter. That's the kind of prayers we used to see, right? I got lots of them. It's just they pop up at the right time. I don't know if there's another one yet. Are we, do we have one more? Because I Okay, this is, um, we were in Florida, never go anywhere, but we did one time, went to visit my daughter and and we had to go see something at this this guy who's building a lens for the Buffalo White House. And so we went to the shrine, and over there, there was this, I saw this statue. This is by a South American artist, and I happen to have some money in the Blessed Mother's account because, I mean, sometimes we're dead broke, and other times people give us money, and we get by really okay. This statue is an expectant Blessed Mother. It's so beautiful. I, I, it's so beautiful, and I had actually had enough money in that that account and I said to my husband, I said, we're buying it. He said, how are we going to get it back? We had a rental car. So they, I had a picture of these people wrapping it up in tons of bubble wrap, and we took her home. She's in the chapel of the Blessed Mother's House. Isn't that beautiful? You never see that. It's awesome. If anybody ever wants to come up and see it when, we're, when you're around town, let me know ahead of time. And I'll, you, you can't believe it. It is breathtaking. Next, please. Okay, that's just the Blessed Mother's house at night. You can see the chapel windows up high, front, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, we've got this place. So we, we were able to rescue something from the, from the clutches of the... Cords, um, whatever they are. Okay, next, please. <clears throat> okay, there's the mosque. You want to go be a mosque? You can go to Queen of Peace Church, and it's not Queen of Peace anymore. Next, please. Okay, and that's it. Next, please. I don't know if there's any more. Okay, and that ends it. So, at any rate, okay, the title of this talk is Sword in the Heart. <clears throat> now, we saw Jesus meeting his afflicted mother and all the heartbreak that's out there. We see how there's no Catholic schools, and I just want to mention one thing here. Some of you, I don't know if you, ever, you does anybody know who Jimmy Fallon is, that TV guy, does a late night show. Okay, so they did an interview with him on, uh, he's no, he's no halcyon of virtue, I'll tell you that, but they did an interview with him, and it was very interesting because they said, uh, you still go, he was Catholic, he said, and the guy, the interviewer said, you still go to church? He said, I don't go to, I tried to go back. When I was out in LA, I was kind of struggling for a bit. I went to church for a while, but it's kind of, it's gotten gigantic now for me. It's like two, there's a band. There's a band there now. And you've got to, you have to hold hands with people through the whole mass now. And I don't like doing that. You know, I mean, it used to be shaking hands, the shaking hands piece was the only time you touched each other. And uh, then further questions. Now I'm holding hands. 
Now I'm lifting people up like Simba. Is I'm doing too much. I don't want. There's frisbees being thrown. This is what Vance says he's gone to in, out in L.A. There's beach balls going around. People waving lighters, and I go. This is too much for me. I want the old way. I want to hang out with the you know with the nuns. You know that was my favorite type of mass in the grotto. Just like straight up the mass. The mass. He used to go to mass with his grandfather. He said. I just love the church. I love the idea of it. I love the smell of the incense. I love the feeling when you get when you left the church. I loved how this I loved how this priest can make people feel good. I just I love the whole idea of it. My grandfather was very religious. I used to go to mass with him at 6:45 in the morning and serve mass. He went back and what did he see? The three ring circus. We have masses out our way and somebody at the gas station said, Stacy, you know, Polish ancestry, he said, There's, we're having the polka mass. And I said, well, you have a good time. I don't mess with that. <clears throat> That's sad. But if Jimmy Fallon, who went down the wrong path, had gone back to the real church, you, you would have had a decent, strong Catholic out of him. So we, we know the suffering, the sword in the heart, you could see the suffering in Father Gruner's eyes, but as far as I know him, he was so humble. He never let out a micron of how he was condemned, hated, derided, libeled, slandered, and he, he soldiered on. Never, he was never killed, but it must have been like a daily death, sharing in the agony in the, agony in the garden of our Lord, not to even talk about the diabolical attacks that the workers in the vineyard know are there. Parents in my part of the state begged for their schools so the diocese to remain open with their parishes, and the doors were literally slammed in their faces, though they were operating schools. Now, of course, there's no battalions of nuns to populate them that worked for, you know, for room and board. Uh, but, you know, I ran a school in, in uh, Derby for 13 years, and we and I always said we paid our teachers bus fare, but it was a good school. It was somebody that taught in the public schools came, and she worked there for a while, and she said, this place is paradise. It was, it was really beautiful. It was probably the best part of my life running that school. I just loved it more than anything I've ever done. So basically, they've got these flimsy Catholic schools, but at least they give people a Catholic identity. But there's nothing, these kids have no place to go. So the whole gospel is love. Love one another as I have loved you. Anticipate one another's needs. Sorry, my experience with a lot of people, I don't care what traditional and modern, they're all about, they sing the I, I, I song. You all know that Spanish song. I, 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 canta no llores. We know what that means, I, I, but they say it a different way. But I'm saying it's I, I, I. I need, I want, I've got, I got to get. I'm going to, you know, be prepared for the big holocaust. These kids are dying. They need friends. They need helpers. You know, forget about what's coming. Forget about all this fancy stuff. There are young people out there with nobody to help them. Nobody. So they have no hope. So we're, you know, what is this anticipating one another's needs? Where are the bishops? Where are the priests? Where are the John Boscos? They, they're not around. They're not around. So these young people have no hope. Hundreds of deaths of these beautiful young people are dead in our, in our, in our town. It's in the paper all the time. Overdoses of heroin, painkillers, suicides. The suicide rate is through the roof. We used to have John Boscos and Father Knows and Father Bakers. And right now, the only people I know willing to march into hell for that heavenly cause and the works that I do in the courts, seeing some of these things, are a, a, a minister in uh, Lake Mount, New York, and also another one who bumped into me in a court when I was doing a heroin defense case. I had to because we want to save this kid rather than have her go into jail because as soon as they get out of jail, the drug dealers are giving them free samples on the steps and they're back into their habits. And, and once you put that needle, these people get the needle. It, it's almost impossible to bring them back. His name's Cal, wears a collar, and he works with these kids. He's doing the kind of work the church used to do. So there's no one looking for these kids. Who in the church is running something for these kids? Nobody. They're so lonely, and this world is so cruel. It's unfortunate. But the church is busy denuding centuries of soul saving with flimsy celebrations that the youth which are glorified, these youth days, I've heard about them, they're just, oh, you're wonderful because you do whatever you want, have a ball, do it all. And I've talked to a priest who went to some one of these big youth masses somewhere, and he said at the end of the big celebration in the stadium, there were communion hosts all over, and he said there was so much leftover consecrated wine, he said he drank so much of it he wouldn't have been able to stand up, and he had to leave some of it behind. That's, that's how things, and kids pick up on this. Kids know... A, Fake when they see it, okay? Troubled youth, they know what's phony. They know bogus. 
old ladies on the east side, you want to talk about the sword and the heart? They, their parish church was their life. They're, you know, basically 92 of the most beautiful churches in Buffalo have been closed, demolished, sold to Muslims, sold to Protestants, sold for soup kitchens. I have one over here as a soup kitchen, and they just gave $10,000 to St. Gerard's. That wasn't one of the slides, but it's just incredible. These women were so angry that they left orders. They would not be buried out of their remake church because what they do is they consolidate, they consolidate, they consolidate, and then they make it a, a what is it, a, a What's the word? They have some word for it. You can go in there and have something, but it's not really a church anymore. And that's oratory. They call them oratories. And the next thing you know, the church they consolidated five, six, seven, eight churches in is gone, closed, sold. You know, uh, if it's not demolished, it's given away to somebody that doesn't even have any. I mean, it's not the Catholic Church anymore. So uh, basically, these women demand they get buried out of the funeral home. They were betrayed and tossed aside like so much trash. This is love. This is compassion. This is caring for the people who took their pennies and paid for those stained glass windows. And you treat them like, like, like a bunch of old good for nothing. What do you know, ladies? Because we're just in there having a polka mass. They want no part of it. That's, that's the sword in their heart. So then you got modern Catholics versus traditional Catholics versus liberal Catholics. There's more vile spewed one against the other. And then you've got the holier than thou, thou's that don't want their, their, their laurel, you know, rural selves tainted because look at those dirty kids. Those dirty kids need their souls to be saved. Somebody's got to help them. Okay. They've got everything. They dress grungy. They have everything pierced from top to bottom, but their hearts are lonely and hurting. Then you got family wars because of fractures in the church. This one can, you know, that one's a schismatic and this one's, a, you know, so you get families fighting swords in the heart. People who have been divorced against the, you know, against their wishes. There are people who have been divorced against their wishes and they live by the rules. They don't remarry. Okay. They may have had a cheating, beating, vile, abusive spouse. And maybe the vile, abusive spouse is on number two or three or living with somebody, you know, shacking up. And basically now, okay, Francis is giving these perpetrators of this a free pass. They don't care. They don't repent. There's a funeral. They'll walk up to the communion rail right in the face of people that are, that are living by the laws of the church. That's scandal. That's scandal. You're creating scandal, right? So these poor people are standing by while the unrepentant, unrepentant, unrepentant offenders are glorified. And you know the scripture. If your son asks for, for an egg, do you give him a stone? If he asks for bread, do you give him a scorpion? It sounds like where we're at. I've been in the crosshairs every day since I decided I didn't want to hand my children a world where life was cheap and disposable and been attacked by all sides. They call me a radical Catholic. But, you know, basically, there's a desperate need for the poor youth of today. Who's going to help them? Who, who's going to help these kids? In my opinion, I know we have heard when the shepherd is struck, the sheep scatter, right? We know that scripture. I'm going to be a little tough because I don't pull any punches. This is where I'm at. It wasn't the shepherd struck. The shepherd not only abandoned those in desperate need of the true faith, but the shepherds have attacked us. They've attacked. We've been attacked, you know, by the shepherds. You know what you get treated like. You know what you get treated like when you stand up for the truth. So basically, basically, it's the sword in our heart, hearts, and the most horrid swords were in the heart of Mary. And it's because of her suffering that she is so powerful with God. She is so powerful with God, so we really have to pray more and sacrifice more. And, you know, it's hard to do sacrifices, at, you know, and, and fast. It's just what's needed. But I, I don't know what's going to turn this around. But it's funny because you take out your old missile, and there's a prayer for everything, the recolta. There's a prayer for everything. And there's one prayer that I, I don't think it's up there, but it, it, was, it was in the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. I keep it on my dresser. It's a good prayer to say, oh, God. You know that, placed as we are amid such great dangers, we cannot, by reason of our human frailty, stand. Grant us health of mind and body, that by your help we may overcome the things which we suffer for our sins. And that's a good prayer to say, I think, right? You know, you have suffering. So at any rate, that's the end of it. There's another uh, really good, uh, good prayer. To, we all say the prayer to St. Michael. Everybody's familiar with that, right? Nobody here doesn't know that. But there's a nice prayer to him, too. Heavenly Father, I commend... Oh, that was the children's prayer. That's not the one. 
Uh, I already told you that one, so you don't need that anymore. Anyway, that's it. Um, sorry for the state of the church. I'm sorry I'm such a roughneck, but that's the way it was raised. And one last thing, if you if you saw in the paper, there was a terrible, terrible earthquake in Ecuador, and the statue of our mother of Montserrat in a church that fell down and everything fell apart around it, right? The statue survived against all odds. That tells you the power of Mary, and even a statue, even a statue of Mary has power. So thank you for tolerating me uh, and listening to me. And uh, I basically, I you know, I just ask you, you know, do do what Mary wants, because if we don't do it, it's not going to get any better. Thank you.